I just had a, a friend of mine on my podcast that last year in October, he had been in his Jackson Big Rig, which is a very wide kayak. He had been in it for about eight years. He was out duck hunting, reached over, made a mistake, flipped over, went in the water. Uh, if it wasn't for his friend actually being there um, to, to save him and to get him back to shore, he might not have been here today. Um, that's episode 10 on the, uh, the Lake Erie Kayak Anglers podcast. You can go back and, and check out that story. Um, but the point I want to make is this is a guy that's in one of the widest kayaks on the market with, you know, eight years of experience that ended up finding himself in that situation. Uh, so first and foremost, you always want to dress for the swims. What happens basically when, when you go in that cold water, the first thing that's going to happen is an involuntary gasp reflex. And your body is naturally just going to gasp. What happens is if you're underneath that water, you're going to suck in water and you're going to drown. Um, if you're not wearing a PFD, you're going to sink to the bottom of the lake. So, if you get past that initial gas reflex, now you're going to go through your your, your um, maximum intensity cold shock, which basically is two to ten minutes of gasping for air and just hyperventilating, trying to catch your breath. Once you get your breath uh, under control, then you can actually try to get back in your kayak. Now, there's there's another hidden danger that's going on in that process. When you hit that cold water, your blood is rushing to your, your inner core, and it's, it's creating a, a very high and instantaneous uh, spike in your blood pressure, which is also going to give you, um, you know, some heart issues, maybe a potential heart attack or something like that. Um, on top of that, once you get through all of that, now you're in the water, say, five to ten minutes. Your body is already starting to lose the ability to move. You're starting to lose your, you know, your dexterity. And, and what happens is when you try to get back in your kayak, you realize you're not going to get back in. Um, for, for a number of reasons. The, the cold water is starting to kick in. Your hypothermia is starting to kick in. Um, and, and the other reason, probably the most common reason, is because you didn't practice ever. So now you're in a situation, your kayak's upside down, you're in the water, and you're like, oh, crap, what do I do now? Well, the first thing that, that should go through your head is, well, I should have I should have practiced before because if I would have practiced before, I'd know exactly what to do in that dangerous situation. With that being said, you know we're going to have Jeff show us some techniques, some, some reentry techniques, and uh, and some ways just to get back in and practice uh, for when you do go. 
after you get through it, you know, the most common thing that people think about when it comes to cold water is hypothermia. Well, that's probably the least common danger. You know, all the other things that I talked about before, the involuntary gas reflex, your maximum intensity cold shock, that, that spike in the blood pressure, those are immediate dangers. Once you get through those, then you have that, that hypothermia situation that you have to deal with. And, you know, if you're still in the water because you, you just fought off that, that maximum intensity cold shock, it's, it's even more dangerous. So what Jeff's gonna do is, Jeff wants to talk about um, the, the signs to identify that because it's not only getting in the water, you can get hypothermia when you're outside of the water. You're on the top of your kayak, you're out there and maybe the rain comes in. Or the wind kicks up and now you have a lot of waves coming over your boat, um, which is getting you wet. So now you, you're getting wet, you have the wind blowing, your body temperature's coming down. If you're spending, you know, six, seven, eight hours on the water, you want to be able to identify uh, the signs of hypothermia. So if your buddy or Jeff's over there and you start to experience it, you can say, hey man, are you doing okay? I feel like you're in danger. So we want to, uh, Jeff's going to just talk about some of those, uh, some of those signs to look for. I'm making Hannah very nervous walking in with the microphone. Look at her. She's mad. I want some urgent, I promise. So the signs and symptoms of hypothermia, I refer to as the umbles. You mumble, stumble, fumble, and grumble. In other words, you resemble an angry drunk. Very appropriate analogy here for uh, St. Patrick's Day, right? So I've been there with hypothermia and experienced those symptoms. Uh, it was one of the two th times, you know, in my kayak fishing career where I thought, hey, it's been a good run. I'm gonna die now, because I can't get things done that I need to get done. Uh, in that situation, I was on a week-long camping float trip on the, on the upper Potomac River, uh, the border between there is West Virginia and Maryland. But we were camping and um, we had been in the water all day and we had done, you know, we had covered, I think that whole trip we did 67 and a half miles in, in about six and a half days. But it was somewhere in the middle and the tent leaked and our sleeping bags were soaked and we were out of the kayaks, but we had been up all night trying to start a fire and were totally unsuccessful. Uh, and we went to bed and I woke up, actually I never really went to bed, but around 2.45 a.m., my buddy and I said, we have to start a fire. And in the winter, you know, when I, when I go kayak fishing in the winter, I carry a dry bag that has all sorts of different methods to get dry clothing on myself, but also to be able to start a fire fast. Uh, and, you know, the, the precursor to all that is wearing the dry suit. You have to have the dry suit, and obviously the, the life jacket is, is, you know, is mandatory. But I exhibited those symptoms of mumble. My speech was slurred. I, and you will actually, if you're hypothermic, you'll try to say something, and different words will come out of your mouth. It's just, it's, it's, it, you're like, and you listen to yourself, you're like, that's not what I meant to say. So it's more than slurring your speech. You, you do mumble, your, your brain to mouth communication just fails. Like, you can't communicate well. So mumble, stumble, we were walking around trying to find dry wood to, to shave, you know, to get down to, you know, use a knife and get down to, uh, to dry wood. But we're walking around and we're, we're tripping over roots and falling down on our face. So mumble, stumble, fumble, holding the knife. Your, your hands can't, I mean, Chuck, you talked about loss of dexterity. Um, we couldn't hold the knife without dropping it constantly. Uh, so that's the fumble. And then the grumble, we were just irritable. And, and that's the, you know, that's the, the angry drunk part of it. So if you recognize either, and you probably won't recognize it in yourself, you're going to recognize it in other people who you're out on the water with, whether you're, you know, whether you're kayak fishing or sea kayaking or whatever you do that's, that's a water sport in cold weather, white water, whatever it is, recognize it in your friend and hold, hold them accountable and say, you're done. And I actually have my buddy uh, Juan Brute, who's a kayak fishing guy, like Chuck is. Chuck's a kayak fishing guide here on, on Lake Erie. My buddy Juan did it in uh, central Pennsylvania on the, the Susquehanna River. And he and I would go, go kayak fishing in snowstorms all the time. Like it's just, 
we enjoy it, it's fun, but we give ourselves the permission to say, I'm calling it, you just said some stuff that doesn't make sense, or I'm calling it, you did whatever it is that I'm recognizing hypothermia. So recognizing signs and symptoms of hypothermia is critical and going with a buddy who can see it in you and say, pull in your card, we're out. All right, coming back to you, Chuck. All right. So now you understand the dangers of hypothermia. Now we're going to get into you know, the safety clothes, um, the uh, the safety gear that you can use. Obviously, Jeff and I are in dry suits. Um, I'm in a coca tent dry suit. I'm not sponsored by any dry suit company. The the key is don't go out on Amazon buy one that's a hundred dollars less that you've never heard of. At the end of the day, if your dry suit fails, you're probably going to die. So. Spend a little bit extra money, go with the reputable brand, NRS, Kogitat, Mustang, you know, something that, that is actually gonna do the job that it's designed for, and it's not just some, you know, fly-by-night Amazon company that's just pushing product out, and when when something happens, they're not gonna be there. So, invest in, you know, something reliable. Um, some people go out in wetsuits. Wetsuits are great, I believe down to about 45 degrees. Uh, you can go colder. You're just going to have to go thicker. Uh, the biggest thing you realize with that is now you're going thicker, well now your movement's less. So you have a, a thick, you know, 8 mil, 10 mil uh, wetsuit on, and your movement is a lot less. So your paddling's a lot less, your netting's a lot net less, maybe getting back into kayak is a lot harder. Uh, so that's why, like, at least for kayak fishing and what we're doing, um, the dry suits just seem to do the job. Um, the other aspect is, you know, a wetsuit is designed to work wet. So unless you have that layer of water in there, it's not going to work properly. Basically what happens is the water gets inside your wetsuit and it warms up from your body. And that stops any other water from coming in. That cold water tries to come in, the hot water says, nope, we're all full in here. You know, so that's how you stay warm with a, with a wetsuit, um, aside from the, the blubber factor. With the dry suit, you don't have to ever worry about that water coming in. Now, if you do, like, for example, third time out, third trip out with this suit years back, I fished all day, I was out on Lake Erie for, I don't know, 10, 10 hours or so, got out of my kayak, started walking, and boom, there went a trouble hook right through my brand new dry suit. So I'm like, well, I did the right thing. I just put a bowl in my dry suit which is going to let water in right so it was at the end of the trip i went home i used the uh, aqua seal sealed it up took care of that problem and i was ready to go uh, with that being said something like that is something that you should carry like aqua seal or like a like gear aid type a i believe it is uh, terror aid type a um, because you're going to have those situations where you might need to make a patch and you might need to make it now on the water and you know, prevent the water from coming in. So, now when it comes to dry suits, there's two different kinds. You're gonna hear uh, two terms, your semi-dry suit and your regular dry suit. Um, me, personally, I'm in a semi-dry suit. If you've seen any of my videos, all the cold water videos, I'm swimming in the semi-dry suit that Coco Tab makes. Uh, the thing that makes a semi-dry suit is your neoprene neck gasket. So it's a neoprene cinch down net. Might let a teaspoon, two teaspoons of water in, but not enough to, to get in any danger for me. But I do have I do have the latex wrist gaskets. So no water's coming in over here. Now on the flip side, Jeff's suit is actually a full dry suit. It has your, your uh, latex neck gasket up here, which might not be as important for a, a kayak angler, but anybody that's in like sea kayaks or whitewater kayaks, you know, they're going in the water a lot. They might have a waterfall coming down on them. They really need that that real tight, tight seal around the neck um, that the, the latex will do. Um, the flip side, some people are allergic to latex, uh, and some people don't like to be strangled um, all day. So that's where the, uh, the neoprene neck gasket comes in. The other factor, you have your PFD on, it's keeping you above the water, and if you have the proper underlayers, even if you get a trickle or two down the, your back, 
it's not going to put you in any dangerous situation. So, on top of the dry suit or the semi-dry suit, whatever you try, you're going to have uh, some kind of boots. Obviously, these are the uh, the NRS boundary boots. Um, I believe they're what five millimeters or three millimeters. So three millimeters thick. Keep my feet warm and they keep my booties protected. Um, gloves, gloves are always very important. Now with an angler, you're constantly taking your gloves off. So I generally don't wear gloves except for when I'm trying to warm up my hands. So I just use just a regular pair of winter gloves with hand, uh, hand warmers in there. So I get it with the fish, 10 minutes later my hands are ice cubes. I stick them in the gloves, I get them warm real quick, pull them back out, I can shoot videos, set my lines, do whatever I need to do. The more important part is actually like a neoprene bar cover or a hood. Because even with your dry suit, even with your gloves on, your boots, when you hit that water, your central nervous system is hitting that cold water. And if you if you go to my YouTube channel and you look at the video where I'm, I'm jumping into icy water, you'll notice I step out of the water and I'm like, I'm trying to get my bearings together because that ice hit my head, or not the ice, but the cold water hit my head and my brain's like, whoa, what's going on? Now, the thing to realize, obviously, I have a dry suit, I'm in a good situation, I'm not dangerous, but it took, it took a minute to shake that off. What that tells you is you always want to have a, a neoprene neck gasket or a, a, a neoprene bar club on because you don't want to get in that situation where you might need that minute or two to think. Uh, perfect example, a uh, buddy of mine, Molt Avery from the National Center for Cold Water Safety. Uh, I brought his wife on the podcast to a round table for uh, ladies wanting to do cold water. And one of the things that she had brought up was she was learning, she, they practice how to roll every time they go out. And she got out there, she didn't have her hood on or anything like that. She got out there, she rolled over and she popped out of the boat. And her, her husband's like, what happened? She's like, I don't know. Well, you know what happened? Her head hit that cold water, she temporarily lost her focus, and she let go of her boat. So, that's something you want to consider when you're out there. You know, it's, it's definitely not something that a lot of people talk about, but it's something that can put you into a situation where, you know, you, you might need that time back. Um, with that being said, moving on to the underlayers. Underlayers, you're not going to want to use anything cotton. So, um, wool, polyester, uh, nylon, fleece, anything like that that's wicking. Uh, and, and even if it gets wet, it's still going to have insulating properties. Like I'm sure you probably went out, stepped in cold water with uh, wool socks, you know, and run your socks out, put them back on, and fish the rest of the day. You know, because even though they were a little bit wet, they still had those insulating properties. So that's that's really what you want to look for when you're you're working on your underlayers. And then you're going to layer it. So you're going to layer it depending on the temperature of the water. But you also don't want to overheat yourself, so you don't want to overdress for the air temperature. You want to make sure that you can swim in the cold water, so testing. Get out there, test your, your underlayers in your dry suit. Um, and and uh, the, the other factor is, so for example, the 120 rule. We'll, we'll go into that. You have, you have your water temperature, which is say, it's going to be above 32 degrees, right? Because it's not full solid, it's going to be above 32 degrees. Well, if you're like Jeff or I, it might be 10 degrees outside. Now you're two miles offshore, well the wind's blowing 20 miles an hour, so you're prepared for swimming, you're not prepared for the cold water that's coming at you. You know, so a lot of people say, oh the 120 rule is what you want to do, the air temperature plus the water temperature equals 120, then you don't need any safety gear. That's absolutely false. Throw that rule out the window. You want to factor the cold water temperature totally separate from the warm water, the, the um, air temperature, the cold air temperature. So I test with, with my underlayers. I know that I can survive the cold temperatures of the water um, at that temperature. On top of that, I carry uh, like good rain gear um, with uh, like a rubber membrane. What that's going to do is it's going to act as a windbreak. So, I don't need it necessarily to go in the water. You know, my underlayers and my dry suit is going to keep me safe there. But when I am out there and I'm actually starting to get chilled because the air temperature is a lot colder than the water temperature, 
I can throw that thing on, throw that, that rain jacket on, keep the wind from piercing through me and making me cold. And once I get a little bit warm, I can pull it off. Because you don't you don't want to sweat in your suit and you don't want to soak yourself because you know then again we're going back to just getting cold and, and becoming hypothermic. So uh, that's that's pretty much what I have for the underlayers and stuff like that. I, uh, I definitely want to save some time and, and let Jeff show you how to kind of flip these kayaks over the bigger kayaks and re-enter them. Uh, it's a little bit different than like your sea kayaks that are they're easier to flip back over. Like this thing is it's over three feet wide. Uh, so once you flip it over, you know now you're in a situation where it's like, well, do I sit on top of the kayak and wait for rescue, or do I flip it over and get back in the kayak? So I will. Uh, I'll let you. Know how that Alright, I'm just gonna yell instead of holding the mic because I knew yeah. Hannah was nervous. I'll tell you what, I will come in the water and uh, hold the mic for you. So, here's how things have gone with regard to fishing kayak design. When I started fishing out of kayaks in the late 90s, we were using recreational kayaks. Um, you know, one of the ones that I used a lot in the early days was the Tarpon 140. Still paddled similar to one of the touring kayaks, and it you know it paddled well. It was narrow enough to be really efficient when you when you paddle to really get you moving, right? What they didn't have is tremendous primary stability. And the first question I hear from most people who are getting into kayak fishing is what is the most stable kayak there is? Because that's the one I want, because I'm afraid of flipping. Right? That is it. Stability is not something that is inherent to a boat. <laughs> All right, Chuck. Stability is not something that's inherent to a boat. It is something you learn with practice, right? And, and the practice that, and I was a kayak fishing guide like Chuck for about 10 years in the middle, mid-Atlantic area. I, I did kayak fishing classes on the Susquehanna River, the Potomac, the Rappahannock, and it was, I mean, it was whitewater skills for kayak anglers, right? I certified as an ACA instructor and took that, you know, took that to teaching people how to fish out of kayaks. One of the first things that I had my, my clients, my students do, is flip kayaks, because that teaches stability. And I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna tell you what I do before I start doing it, uh, but it's it's to progressively lean on one side or the other of the kayak until it does flip. Lean over and then try to save it at the last minute. Now, going into this, I'm gonna tell you, I am in one of the widest kayaks that you can buy. It is one of the hardest kayaks to flip over. The danger of it, of a Jackson Take Two, is that you have this false sense of security. You believe you cannot flip. But then when you do all of that amazing primary stability that you that you enjoyed and thought I'm invincible, if once it's flipped over, is working against you to right this boat so that you can re-enter. So I'm gonna go over the drill that I use to, you know, to train people so that they learn, hey, it's not here or here or here, but it's like this is the point of no return. That's what you're trying to feel by leaning into each each side on this super stable, super wide fishing kayak, okay? So you learn that, and then you get to practice re-entry, okay? But in the middle, we're gonna practice one other thing, and I have two pieces of equipment on this boat right now that are critical for anyone in one of those super wide kayaks. Your, your Hobie Pro Angler 14s that are in the booth there, the native Titan, what's another wide kayak besides the Jackson Take Two? The Jackson Big Rig. There's there's a lot of just super wide ones out there because Yeah, the autopilots. Yeah, I mean you gotta learn the point of no return and that's what we're gonna do. But I'm using a roof rack strap in one instance and then I'm using a paddle float in the other so that you can see different ways to reboard. To be fair, when I have people test, I don't have them test in water like Chuck's in here to where he can stand up. You need to be able to learn how to and practice how to reboard 
without the assist of springboarding off the bottom of the pool or river or lake or wherever you are. It's cheating. You gotta be able to do it in deep water or you're gonna be in trouble because we do lose pack anglers every year to not being able, not knowing and not pra having practiced reboarding. All right, I'm gonna hand this back to Chuck and I'm gonna flip this kayak a couple times and then we're gonna go to reboarding. All right, like Jeff said, the, the most important thing is to identify the stopping point on the kayak. Because once you identify the point of no return, you subconsciously put it in your head, you know, okay, if I go past this point, I'm going in. Somebody blow on him. See, what, what happens is you, you develop a natural balance in the kayak where your body subconsciously, it's like, oh, oh, nope, you're not going to go past that point. Okay, so water's cold. in shallow water, <laughs> no big deal. Well, it sort of is, but you can springboard off the bottom and this. I will tell you, it's never that easy when you have a Yak Attack black pack, a torpedo motor, all these rod holders, transducer hanging off the side. I took a lot of stuff off here in order to do this and I still got gear hanging, right? You have a lot of resistance working against you. So the trick I'm going to teach next and I gotta get this back over to do it. Is, involves what I have back here. I'll pull it out. But it's a simple yak attack tie down strap. Right? So let me get this back over. Alright. So I'm in deep water and I can't reach over and I'm not even gonna beat this hot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reach under there. I have to find my seat. On the back of my seat is a roof rack strap. I gotta find the end of it first. It's gonna take me. Now, if you have a pedal driven kayak, you see where he has that, that black cover there. Generally, unless it's a Hobie or a flipper style, you'll have a skeg sticking down. Uh, the cool thing about the pedal driven kayak. You don't have to worry about the strap. If you have the skeg sticking sticking up, you grab the skeg, use your body weight, clean it down, and it'll help you flip over the kayak. Uh, you can also use a strap like the way that Jeff's going to show you. Uh, depending on how agile you are, you might not be able to reach up and actually get onto the top of that skeg. But it's good to know all the different options, the, all the different ways. Uh, just so you know, you get yourself in a situation and something doesn't work that you thought would have. You kind of have something to fall back on. So talk about the longer I'm in here, the more I'm getting cold, and my dexterity is getting lost. Yeah, the uh, the longer that uh, that you're in the pool, obviously I didn't put any underlayers on. Uh, water's a little bit cold. The the longer that you're in this water, surrounded by this water, the faster that your body temperature is actually dropping. So if, even with the dry suit, if you don't have the proper underlayers. You're going to get cold fairly quick, um, and that's that's why you want to get in and, and actually do the testing so uh, what with I'm doing, your gear and your underlayers. I'm going to take this and attach it to something along a rail on this side, and then I'll flop it and strap over So basically what he's going to do, there's, uh, there's grab handles on the sides of these kayaks. He's just going to put that strap on the one side of the grab handle, throw it over the top of the hole, and then he's going to come on this opposite side, grab that strap, and basically do the same thing like I was talking about with the keel. Use his body weight to pull that kayak back over. So why don't you just flip it over like you did a second ago with your hands? Yeah. If I wasn't in shallow water, I could do it. If you're in deep water, you're not going to be able to lift the kayak over. You just, you, you don't have anything to push against. and the kayak, it basically uh, creates like a suction. Kind of like if you ever flipped over a canoe. 
try to sink the canoe and then pull it out of the water. Alright. I got the strap here. I'm going to even it up a little. Throw it across there. And I will tell you, this is not easy when you're out on Lake Erie and there's rolling four foot, five foot waves to do this. But the strap is going to help you be able to do it. So you're going to pull yourself over here with the strap and get on top of it. Then you get on your knees and then you get to your feet and you come straight back. Turn this around so you can see it. Just have a clean rail. Kayak anglers put all sorts of stuff here. We got a paddle holder, a torpedo throttle, foot control steering, camera mount thing. You gotta be able to reach up here and undo stuff from the track. Get it out of your way. Because you need a clear rail right here to be able to do this. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out was generally uh, before you wash, you'll go ahead and position your strap on your side rail. That way it's already set. Just in case you need it, you already know it's somewhere underneath your seat. All you got to do is reach down and uh, and grab it and flip back over. Um, again, like I said, it's not if you go in, it's when. So the, uh, the object is to always be prepared for it. Okay. Risk of not being politically correct. Hey, fat boy! Can I get a big old belly on you? This is not going to be so easy. When you have a gut, it is a barrier to what you need to do to get back up on you. When you have to pull yourself up and you have this mountain in your abdomen preventing you from doing it, it's not so easy. So. The thing that's going to help you launch back in there is that you're going to kick like crazy. You're going to come up here, grab a hold of something firm, I got the seat, and at the same time, I'm going to pull up and kick until I get my belly over. Then, you're just turning over. At that point, you can sort of recalibrate where you are, get back on the seat, and now you're in a position where you've reboarded, but you're only going to do it adeptly in bad situations where you're out on Erie or wherever you are, and it's rough. If you practice this, you have to practice reboarding. That's it. That's all I got. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple other things that you can use to reboard. Uh, there's paddle floats um, that you can actually take and uh, and blow up. Um, there are a couple of uh, like rescue ladders that, uh, that that are on the market. Um, there's simple ones that you can make with PVC, basically just uh, just a PVC piece sealed off so it floats on a rope. That way, you know, especially if your upper body strength isn't the strongest you're going to want to use your legs to kind of push yourself onto the kayak as you're pulling. So you can use a, a rescue ladder um, or, or just basically a floating piece of PVC on a rope to use as a stirrup, get your foot in and push yourself onto the kayak. And uh, Jeff, that's the paddle float there. Um, now that for me personally, the downside of the paddle float is you better not need to get back in quick because you got to take the time to put it on and, and blow it up. They do make some that are blown up, um, but you might want to think a little bit differently if you're in cold water. Maybe go with the one that's already inflated.
So basically what the paddle float is going to do is it's going to give you a little bit of buoyancy so that you can kind of straddle your leg around and use that to get you out of the water, get you higher over the, uh, the edge of the kayak so that you can push yourself back out. Stick it under anything that, uh, that you can that, that'll just secure it and keep it from moving for you. So the way that the way that I teach re-entry in my in my videos, and, and it's it's the same exact thing that Jeff's doing. I just want to break down the technique a little bit. Um, so the object, obviously, if you're vertical in the water, you try to pull your kayak, try to pull yourself in your kayak, you're gonna roll it over. So the first step is to be parallel with the water. You're gonna expand your kayak, kick your feet, and bring your body up. And once you get your body up, then you can reach up. Kick your feet and cover yourself up. But the most important thing is to be parallel with the water surface so that you're not kicking the kayak back over on yourself. I can even show you that real quick if you want. Um, what, what, uh, do you guys have any questions on anything? Folks, Q&A session. What do you need to know? You got a kayak. You got to come over to you. I'll put the microphone in everybody's face. So, how many of you guys actually uh, kayak in cold water? All right. So, at least half. I know. I know you guys are in uh, dry suits and wet suits. Um, how about everybody else? You guys in dry suits or or you like wet suits? What's that? Neoprene. Neoprene? Yeah. Nice. So the rest of you guys haven't kayak fished in cold water, haven't kayaked in cold water, but you're thinking about it, right? I, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I can't stay off the water for six months. You know, the cold water season comes and I, I put my kayak away for a week and I'm, I'm like, I'm going crazy. So that's basically what led me down the, uh, the path to get the dry suit. And since, you know, it's kind of hard to find somebody as crazy as Jeff to fish when I like to fish. I usually fish alone, um, which led me to my testing, you know, and, and the testing video because at the end of the day, I got to be able to save my own life, right? And and make it back, not for me, but, but for my family, for my daughter, you know, for my loved ones, because they're the ones that suffer. So if you look at a dry suit, yeah, it's six, seven, eight hundred bucks, maybe a thousand bucks. What's the, what's the value on your life for you? What about for your loved ones, right? What what are they gonna feel if something happens? And and on top of that, this suit, I think this is this is the fifth season in this suit. So you're gonna get five to ten years out of your suit, you take care of it, you get a good reliable suit. What's that break down to? hundred bucks a year? That's worth it, right? Get out on the water a couple of times safely and uh, and always make it back to your family. So just something to think about um, at the end of the day. Uh, our lives, you know, don't just belong to ourselves. They they belong to the, the ones that, that love and care about us, um, that we're obligated to make it back. So, you know, you look at the money, you look at your loved ones, and I know you'll make the right decision. Fishing is life, but safety comes first. And my card's over there. I'm always available. If you guys have any questions, you can hit up Jeff Little on his YouTube channel, uh, The Little Stuff. Um, awesome, all kinds of awesome great content over there. Check out the playlist and stuff. Uh, you can book a trip with me, LakeErieKayakFishing.com. Come out offshore. You know, we uh, I, I basically build it around your comfort level. So if you're a novice and you've never kayak fished before, I got you covered. We'll get out on a calm day, work out all the kinks, spells, and whistles, 
if you're an experienced guy at Gangway, you want to get out in three quarters with somebody that you know kind of watches your back and knows a little bit. Um, I got you covered there too. So basically, anything that you're looking to do, we can make it happen. Uh, I obviously am not going to take you out in four to six footers though, uh, but I, I will make a video so you can watch. Thanks guys. And don't go anywhere. Um, well, you can take a lap if you want to, but at 5 o'clock, at 5 o'clock we'll have the Metro Parks coming back, or 6 o'clock now. 6 o'clock, Metro Parks are coming back. We're going to have two sub-sessions back-to-back, so if you're interested in stand-up paddleboard, um, they will be here doing a rescue rodeo, as well as going over some beginner to advanced paddling techniques. So come on back at 6 o'clock and we'll have some more.